All right, we're skipping this because screw it, I'm not reading it twice. There we go. It's just, this looks like the prequel to, um, like in the other books where they have like that little what's happening in this year because this is going on about like house prices and stuff like that so and the and the um music and stuff like that so we're skipping that i'm not reading it it's too much i can't fine i'll read it oh by the way if you're new to this channel um this is me procrastinating on getting more important things done by reading uh, these old locally done books. So this is a uh, matter of murder. This is the first book. We already went through the second book because I found that one first. And uh, the last time, last episode we did Murder of John Hazling. And um, I'm very bad at reading out loud. So apologies in advance. We're just going to get onto this because these are relatively big ones. That one looks fun. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is there a shadow here? The window is behind me, so that's probably what the shadow is. Sorry about that. Yarmouth County's first unsolved murder. Benjamin to Fry, October 18th, 1884. The murder of Benjamin to Fry has remained unsolved for more than a hundred years. It is chronicled as one of the first murder cases in Yarmouth history, in the history of Yarmouth County. Oops, sorry. There we go. Benjamin to Fry was a well-known resident of East resident of East River. He was a hardworking man that had planned to be married within the next few months. He spent Saturday, October eighteenth digging potatoes from his land. When it came time to call it a day, Trefry left his potatoes in a barrel with the intention of picking them up early the next week. It was a cold, crisp fall afternoon when Benjamin Trefry left his brother's house on the Tuscott Fork Road near East River. It was late Saturday afternoon and he had planned to go to Fred Armstrong's home, which is about a mile and a half away. It was his routine to visit his fiancée, Sarah Jane Frost, who lives at the Armstrong home. Trefry never arrived. It is very unlikely that he left town. Barrels of potato were left in his field. He had hired two men to work on his house the next morning, Monday, or the next Monday. At a search of his house accounted for all of his belongings, including his money and trunk. On Monday, October 20th, 1884, when two hired men arrived at Benjamin Trefry's to start work on his house, Trefry was nowhere to be found. This was when people realized he was missing. As soon as the men informed his father, Joseph Josiah, Josiah, J Joseph, Joshua Trefry, sir, a search was immediately organized. The path from Benjamin's why did I keep saying his full name? The path from Benjamin's brother's home to Fred Armstrong's house collided, collided through the woods near Lake. Over the next few days, about 150 men searched the woods and lakes, but to no avail. The search used grappling hooks to comb the lake at East River and the East River. Later, a diving suit was procured by searchers, and the lake and area were most th more thoroughly searched. But again, no trace of Benjamin was found. The only evidence that the searchers did find along the trail, Dulong, was along the trail Dulong and others claimed he regularly walked. A hunting dog found a spot of blood on the path and on a few leaves remaining on some of the shrubs. As, as well, searchers discovered the sm a small flexible branch of a willow had been recently cut off with a blunt, with a blunt knife. The searchers also found a spot where it appeared as if a gun had recently been set down. An interesting occur coincidence was that the cut piece from the willow tree was found in the possession of Fred Armstrong a few hours later. This scant evidence led the searchers to suspect foul play. Shortly after the search was conducted, was concluded, and a small result of the speculation 
and a small and as a result of the speculation a local man Absalom Hurlbert was arrested for the murder of Benjamin Terfry. However, the charges were complicated by the fact that the body of the missing man was not found. Hurlbert was taken to the Yarmouth jail. With no evidence and no formal complaint, Sheriff T.B. Flint had no choice but to release Hurlbert. After learning Absalom's Hurlbert was free, several local residents came to his house and threatened to kill him. As a result, he fled to the sheriff's home for safety. Hurlbert asked the sheriff if he could leave the county. The sheriff told him not to go because this action in itself could be evidence of guilt. Further, the sheriff suggested that such an action would be pointless unless the incriminating evidence was found. In spite of his assurance, Hurlbert left the area after his meeting with Sheriff Flint. Mr. Pelton and Mr. Sleth the next morning after his meeting with Sheriff Flint, Mr. Pelton and Mr. Smith. The next the, ne the next resident the next the residents heard from Herbert was he would turned up in Salem, Massachusetts a few weeks later. After he was released, the residents focused their suspicions on another person, Fred Armstrong. Turned into a fucking witch hunt it looked like. Even brought Salem into this. A warrant for the arrest of Fred Armstrong was on the charge of being involved with the murder of Benjamin Trevi. Was issued by the Justice of the Peace, W. V. w, w. v. Brown. On November 15, 1844, an inquiry was held by the Justice, but held before Justice Brown of Arcadia. At this examination, Josiah Trevi, Sr., Sylvain Dulong, David Andrews, Cable Trefry, Eva, Her Eva Hurlbert, and Odin Hurlbert, Amelia Hurlbert, and Sarah Jane Frost gave evidence. According to their testimony, Benjamin was accustomed to walking the same logging trail every Saturday to visit Sarah. He returned to his home every Monday or Tuesday. Mrs. Frost told the inquiry that she and Mr. Trefry were to be married in just a few days. She claimed that the last time she saw him was Monday before his disappearance, namely October 13th, 1884. She recalled that he left the Armstrong home around 5, 5 p.m. that day, and he told her that he would return the following Saturday afternoon. She claimed that they parted company on the best terms. The next she heard of Jeffrey was on Wednesday, October 23rd, when the searchers told her that he was missing. She noted that Jeffrey often told her that he was worried that he might miss the road through the woods. Jeffrey confided in her that the only thing he feared was walking home was meeting Absalom, Absalom Hurlbert. She told the inquiry that both men were not on good terms with one another. Sarah told the inquiry that Terfry and Armstrong were on good terms with each other. Were on good terms. So, Hurlbert was bad, Armstrong good. She also noted that Armstrong and Hurlbert were on good terms as well, and that they worked together quite often. Frost recalled that the two men worked together hauling bark out of the woods a few weeks ago, and that they, and that they hayed together. She noted that Hurlbert had visited the Armstrong's home about a week before Trefry's disappearance. Disappearance. Frost was the key witness for the defense of Armstrong in that. She accounted for his whereabouts before, during, and after the alleged murder. She told the inquiry that Armstrong had walked into Tusket on Saturday and returned home about one half hour after dark. She noted that he was walking. Further, she stated that he was at home all Saturday night, slept with his wife, and was in bed in the morning. The next witness, Jasif Gavanga, C-A-V-A-N-G-H, Gavang, told the inquiry that he had tea at the Armstrong home on Sunday afternoon and returned home an hour after dark and verified the fact that Armstrong was there the whole day. In her testimony, Sarah Frost confirmed that Fred Armstrong was home all day Monday butchering his sheep. Armstrong told the meat, took the meat to Tusket for sale on, Tusket on Tuesday and arrived home around midnight on Tuesday. 
On Wednesday, Armstrong went to Absom Herlebert's. He carried half a lamb with him that day. That day. The next witness at the inquiry was Sylvan Dulong, who lived about one half mile between Fred Armstrong's home and Calby to Fry. God, I suck at this. Dulong told the inquiry that Belgium, that Benjamin used to walk past his house every Saturday around sundown en route to an to Armstrong's to visit Sarah. On Saturday, October 18th, 1884, however, Dulong was out digging potatoes all day and did not see Tafari walk past. However, just before sundown, Dulong heard a gunshot. He recalled that it sounded as if it was between the two brooks, namely Duke Pond Brook and the smaller stream that cut across the road near his home. He recalled that it sounded as though it came from an area of the lodging road that Benjamin Travai rooted to, t- took routinely, routinely took to Armstrong. The shot sounded like it was just east of his home, towards Calby Travai's. Towards Calby Travai's, he estimated it was about three fourths of a mile away. At the time, Dulong did not give the shot much, much thought. After all, it was fall. He assumed the shot was fired by a hunter. So he continued with his work. Dulong told the inquiry that the first he heard about Trefry's disappearance was when he encountered a large group of men the following Thursday. He was out hunting at the time. Dulong joined the search party and took them to the area where he thought the gunshot gunshot originated from. There he found bloodstains on the ground and on some leaves. About a quarter of a mile away, another searcher found an imprint of some moss where a gun had been placed. He testified that both Armstrong and Herlebert were present when the injuries were made. By now, the testimony of Frost and Dulong resulted in suspicion of residents, and the inquiry shifted back to Absalom Herlebert. At the inquiry, the next witness, witness Joshua Defry told Justice Brown that he had mentioned his suspicions to Fred Armstrong during the search for his son. Joshua Defry remembered that Armstrong replied, Absalom Herbal- Herlbert is not the man, but if Benjamin Defry is found, I can, I can put my finger on the man who committed the crime. Defry mentioned that Herlbert told him on three separate occasions during the search for his son. What did you know? Armstrong viewed view was not the popular opinion as most of the residents as most of the residents Joshua DeVry ref, ref, reforced Sarah Jane Frost's testimony that there was a great deal of ill feelings between J- Benjamin and Absalom Herlebert. He noted that Benjamin DeVry testified against Herlebert when he was accused of illegally fishing. This testimony resulted in Herlebert being found guilty and being forced to pay a fine. Meanwhile, the whole mystery began to take on an interesting international note. Across the Bay of Fundy, residents of the Boston area were beginning to learn the mystery. On November 11, 1884, Absalom Herbert was arrested in Salem, Massachusetts on the complaint of David Andrews, who charged him with the murder of Benjamin Terfai. According to an article in the Boston Journal, based on an interview between a journalist and Herlebert, Absalom Herlebert left the Tuscan area right after the threatening incident with a local resident. He went to Yarmouth and caught the ferry, the Yarmouth-Boston steamer, the Dominion, on Saturday, arriving in Boston the next day. From there, he took the train to Lynn and Waugh. To Lynn, and walk from there to Swampscott. He spent an afternoon and evening in Swampscott. The next day he walked to Salem, arriving there later in the evening. Herbert had stopped at the boarding house in Salem upon his arrival. The innkeeper, Mrs. Alfred Burley, told the city marshal that the man was white as a corpse and very nervous. She searched. She recalled that he looked very ill and she told him to lie down. Herlebert told her that he was very tired due to all the walking over the past few days. Herlebert went upstairs and laid on a sofa while she prepared supper. She 
remembered that he was very she remembered that he was very nervous. He jumped every time the door rang. He was always getting up, walking across the room, opening and closing the door of the stove. She told Mrs. told the marshal that he was often peering out the entryway. Mrs. Burley remembered that he was very anxious and sad and was reading from a small pocket version of the Bible which he carried with him. In the conversation, Herbert told Mr. and Mrs. Burley that he was from the Yarmouth area and lived with his wife and son in Little River in the Tusket Lake areas of Yarmouth County. He told her that a murder was believed to have been committed in the area, but besides that, nothing about it. She recalled that Herlebert asked if she knew David and Ingalls Andrew. Burley replied that she did and gave him directions to their home. Herlebert spent the night at the boarding house. She remembered he had a very little money, and so she did not charge him as much as normal. The next day, he went to see the Andrews, who gave the information to the belief to the police, which led to Herlebert's arrest, told Marshall that, he, that his mother from Yarmouth recently visited him in Salem and told him that Herlebert had been arrested for murder and that he escaped while being brought to Yarmouth. She told him that if he ever saw Herbert, she would call the police right away. Herlebert went to the Andrews' home first and then went down to a wharf where David Andrews was working. Andrews spoke with him shortly him a short time, and after he left, notified the police. Herlebert was arrested that evening and at the board, at the boarding house. He was planning to go to Ipswich to visit some friends he had there. After Herlebert was in custody, the city marshal of Salem telegraphed Sheriff, Sheriff Flint in Yarmouth, asking whether or not Herlebert was wanted. So they arrested him, didn't know if he was wanted, just River. Sheriff Flint sent back a reply. We are not in the position to ask for Herlebert. As a result, the marshal ordered Her Her Herlebert's release. Absalom Herlebert was released, but not before a report was given to the Boston Journal interviewing interviewed him in his jail cell. In his article, the report noted that Herlebert presented a wild, haggard appearance. He was a tall, thin man with restless eyes, red hair, and beard. The story told his reporters in Salem did not agree with what Sheriff Flint was saying in Yarmouth. According to Herlbert, he and Benjamin Trefry had last seen each other on the road to Yarmouth in August. He told the reporter about the threat from the neighbors and said that when he went to the sheriff's for protection, he was advised to leave the county. Herlbert disclaimed all knowledge of what happened to Mr. Trefry. According to the report, Herlbert told a local police officer yet a different story. He said that he had not seen Trevi since last May and not spoke to him since then. He said that he heard about the murder but did not know anything about it. But apparently he was very startled when the officer told him that the body had been found. The officer had made a mistake and confused the, the blood stain with the actual body. Sheriff Flint was concerned about the wrong impression the Boston Journal gave, and they wrote a letter to the editor of the Yarmouth Herald, November 17, 1884. Among the statements reported to be made by Hurlebert in Salem, Massachusetts, is one, is one to the effect that the sheriff advised him to clear out of the county, etc., etc. My urge advice Hurlebert was the exact, was to exact to the contrary, as can be provided by Mr. Pelton, QC, his counselor, and Mr. Sleeth, the, ja the jailer in whose presence on my last interview with the suspected person I pointed out to him the folly of attempting such a course. I told him that it would only be in, in itself an evidence of guilt, but would perfectly would be perfectly useless in a case of other criminalization evidence being discovered. He professed to agree with me and alleged that he had no intention whatsoever of leaving the place, as no warrant was forthcoming. We were without authority to detain him in jail in the face of his own and his countless demands to be set at liberty. Oh, my neck. After his release, Herlebert disappeared. 
As for Fred Armstrong, the inquiry found there was no foundation for the insurance of the warrant, and so he too was released. The body of Benjamin Trefry was never found, even after the local government offered $500 for its discovery. Because of this, Fred Armstrong never did put his finger on the man who committed the crime. Whether or not Mr. Trefry was murdered is not even known. The only real evidence is a patch of blood roughly cut willow, a roughly cut willow branch the sound of a gunshot, and the faint imprint of a gun. Whatever his fate, Benjamin Trefry disappeared still remains a mystery. But an interesting bit of folklore still circulates in the area. Older residents maintain that their forefathers told them that Herbert shot Benjamin. Trefry, that shot Benjamin, and he, along with another person, cut the body up into pieces and disposed of it. That is why none remains were ever found. Elderly residents claim that it was more than a coincidence that Fred Armstrong was doing a lot of butchering that day after Benjamin disappeared. It's an interesting mystery which will probably never be solved. Words are hard. All right. How long is Captain George Perry? Dear God. Oh dear God, you're a big one. Oh dear God. Oh dear God. That's all Perry? It's like half the book. How long have we been doing this one? Do 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 22 minutes. Jesus Christ. Do I have it in me to do this one? Well, I can either do this, or I can do something actually productive with my day. So I guess I'm doing this. All right. The unsolved murder of Captain George Perry, 99 Argyle Street, Yarmouth, February 26, 1962. Here's the map. I don't know if that'll help any. Pause, turn your camera. Okay, so that's north is on this side, east, south, and west. So. Okay, on the map we have Perry sees, sees something in the Yarmouth paper two weeks before his death. And I did, I am dead for sure now. Snowbank. Hog Road, Re Regent Street, Captain Avon Lee, William McNutt, Joseph Trefry, another Trefry, Thomas Nickerson, Mansfield Ross moved his truck and positioned and possessions into Perry's home on 26, 21. Captain's very upset. Captain Perry, Captain L. Okay, that's Tooker Street. I know where Tooker Street is. That's Main Street. Okay, so for me... Actually, yeah, that's right. No. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Okay. <gasps> Wait, this is Argyle Street. I go up this every goddamn day. There's a garage here now. And there is a, a store here, right here on this corner. And these are all houses, and there's a church over here. And these are, these all these houses are still there. All right. Here we go. Perhaps no one can have... Perhaps no one, no one case has mystified a town as much as the mysterious murder of Captain George Henry Perry, Perry on Argyle Street, in Yarmouth Town on February 26, 1921. It is perhaps one of the most bizarre tales ever to emerge out of this small community. The Captain Perry case remains unsolved to this day. Lots of people dabble at, un at solving the mysteries, and a few even claim they have solved it. But the truth of what really happens will never be told. It went to the grave with Captain Perry. 
Yarmouth has changed a lot since that fateful evening in 1921. Today, it is one of the major fishing centers on the east coast of Canada. But back in 1921, it was community struggling to survive. At its peak in the late 1800s, Yarmouth had been the fourth largest port of registry in the world. But the area, the era of tall ships was waiting. Iron steam-powered ships had replaced the huge wooden vessels which had made Yarmouth famous around the world. Both unacceptable and unwilling to adapt to new shipbuilding and trade technologies, Yarmouth was falling backwards rather than moving ahead. You know what? That has not changed. To this fucking day, it's not changed. Within a decade, it was to be in the midst of depression and serious economic hardship. By the early 1920s, the wealth and prosperity were gone. Yarmouth streets were filled with aging, shipless sea captains and their former crew members. All were living on money accumulated during the booming times. Meanwhile, the husk of the wooden ships lay rotting next to crumbling piers, which had once served as lifeboats to the tiny community. The downturn in the economy had other effects besides limiting the finances of members in the community. It had brought a dramatic upturn in the local crime rate. The local newspaper featured a weekly stories about theft, robberies, and even murders which were plaguing the town. Its small, poor, trained police force was caught off guard and for the most part struggled to keep the town under control. This was not an easy task. The police of the 1920s were former soldiers who had served in the First World War. They knew how to fight and how to keep peace, but criminal investigation was not their strong point. Chief of Police Charles Babin was a nice guy and a capable leader, but his power of investigation were limited by the back, by the lack of formal police training, which was so common among the early towns pe- town policemen in rural Canada. Captain George Henry Perry was one of the oldest surviving sea captains from Yarmouth's prosperous years of wooden ships and iron men. Perry had sailed for many years for a local considerable years and for a lo- for a considerable number of them his wife Claire had accompanied him. Some local residents recall that he was a harsh, spiteful man, while others saw him as kind and gentle. It appears as though he had one of those personalities that you either loved or hated. There seemed to be no in-between. At sea, he was known to be a hard but fair captain. Every day as he left his home via his back porch at 99 Argyle Street, he would stop and pick up an iron bar, 15 inches long and one and a quarter inches thick, that lay by the back door of his home. It was an old reminder of his sea captain days. Family and neighbor believed that the bar had come from the inside of a bar from one of his old sailing ships. On February 26, 1921, just as he did every day, Captain Barry used the iron bar to bang the nails on the soles of his shoes back into place. Some shoemakers of the time made shoes with dozens of nails round the base and heel. Often, especially if the customer walked a lot, these tiny nails would work loose, so it became part of his daily routine to put these nails in place. On that Wintry Saturday, little did Captain Perry realize that he held in his hand the very instrument of his own death, which was waiting for him just 12 hours away. After the trail at the trial held at Curling Rink on Brunswick Street before Justice Russell of Nova Scotia Supreme Court, the sequence of events which led up to Captain Perry's death on, death on that cold winter's evening came to light. Claire Perry... Mansfield's wrote, Ross both told the court that Captain Perry left his home at 1 p.m. on Saturday, February 26. It was suggested that he was in an angry state because Manfield Ross had moved in with his trunk. Ross was planning to marry Captain Perry's daughter, Eleanor. Up until that point, it was suggested at the time Perry was blocking the marriage. It was suggested that Captain Perry did not approve of Ross's relationship with his daughter. Apparently, the captain had his sights on a more suitable husband for her, his young daughter. Further, it was established that Ross was part black and that Perry was very bigoted. Whatever was the case, it was clear that Ross arrived at the Perry home that fateful Saturday was not actually well received by the captain. 
From the time he left his home at 1 p.m. until around 4 p.m., Captain Perry precise movement were uncertain. After his death, the police tried to react, retrace his steps, and this proved very difficult, as was mentioned earlier. The chief of police lacked formal training, and as, and as a result, it was suggested by many local residents that at the time that he let the trail, that he let the trail, there's a space in trail. They did not bring in the English class to get this done, did they? The trail get cold before he tried to put the pieces of the puzzle together. As is the case in many small towns, there were rumors running rampant in the town. One of the more popular rumors about Perry's whereabouts was that one that suggested he was at a poker game at Province Church for the bulk of that afternoon. People claimed that the last stake there the pe- were high, so high in fact that it was rumored that one of the players had opened the church safe and removed some money considerably enlarging the size of the pot. That player lost, and so did the church. Curiously enough, the church burnt to the ground the same night the captain was murdered. That's interesting. In fact, Dr. Charles Webster had to go to the burning church to get the Captain Perry's go by the church. In fact, Dr. Charles Webster had to go by the burning church to get to Captain Perry's house to attend to the dying man. Later, the evidence would show that the fire had a suspicious organ. The church lost everything in this fire, including the church, church's financial record and the contents of the safe. The only problem with the rumor is this. Why would the church have a great deal of money in the safe on a Saturday afternoon? Once... One could see this on a Sunday after service, but on Saturday? However, the fact remains that the church didn't, the church did burn to the ground approximately the same time Dr. Webster was treating Captain Perry. Another rumor suggested that the, there was a high-stakes poker game at the other location near Perry's home. At Aiden Glees, his neighbor, again, no evidence ever came forth to establish this one way or the other. Uh, so... There's the church. So where was the church? Maybe it's not in this picture. I don't think that's it. Okay. However, the rumor that the captain... Rumor that Captain George Perry was at the provincial church that afternoon is somewhat supported by the fact that he was known to gamble frequently with his neighbors, Aidan Glee and Harry Milliner. The theory that Captain Perry came into a large sum of money that afternoon is given additional weight by the story of a local jeweler who testified at Perry's murder trial. It was Charles Dyke who then, who next came in contact with Captain Perry approximately three hours after he had left his home on Argyle Street. Durkee told the court that Captain Perry had come into his store, C.E. Durkee Jewelry, around 4 p.m. that afternoon to buy a new wallet. Durkee testified that Captain tried out several wallets because he needed a large one. Apparently, it was stated that Perry flashed a Billful, literally bulging, with appeared to be money. <laughs> After Perry spent a few minutes in the Durkee store, Perry made his way back home, down along Main Street and up Argyle. Given the amount of time it took him to get home, he may have made a few stops along the way. At 6.30 p.m., Claire, Perry, and Ross told the court Captain Perry arrived home for supper. It was suggested that he could have been in his office before coming into the house. Captain Perry used to go into the barn and have a cigarette or a drink of whiskey in one of those stalls, which were referred to as his office. Around 6.40 p.m., Captain Claire, Ross, and Eleanor sat down to supper. It consisted of chicken, which Manfield Ross had acquired earlier that day. From it, Claire prepared an excellent supper. 
ro of roast chicken along with vegetables and condiments. Evidence suggested that the atmosphere around the supper table was very tense with little conversation between those present. This tension possibly considered is possibly considered the presence of Perry the little. The tension is possible considering the presence in Perry's home of Ross, an unwelcome permanent guest in the eyes of Captain Perry. After supper, we believe that Perry retired to one of the front parlors in the home while Claire and Eleanor cleaned up the supper dishes. Mansfield Ross's whereabouts are unclear at this time. However, at 7.15 p.m., a neighbor, Beatrice Mc McKinnon, arrived at Perry's home. She was going to join Ross and Eleanor later that evening at a movie. At 7.30 p.m., Captain Perry got up and put on his hat and coat and left the home by way of the back porch door off the kitchen. He did not say where he was going. Uh, pardon. There are some conflicting reports and timing as to his whereabouts from the time he left his home until his body was discovered. Despite these time disappearances, it was established at the trial that it was his daughter, Eleanor, who was the last member of his family to see him alive. Eleanor testified that she saw him turn Argyle Street and head towards Tom Nickerson's home at 7.45 p.m. At 7.30 p.m., the next-door neighbor told the e took the East William McNutt Jr. No. At 7.30 p.m., the next-door neighbor to the East William McNutt Okay. So that's McNutt right here. Reports of a mysterious figure lurking around the Perry home during the early and late part of the evening. McNutt Jr. testified that when he went out to feed his pigs around 7.45 p.m. at the time, he heard somebody, somebody shuffling in Perry's yard. He recalls seeing nothing. When he came out of his house again five minutes later, saw a dark, dark figure wearing a short coat and hat at the entrance of the Perry Drive. McNutt stated that when he approached the figure, the man went up Argyle Street again. The police investigated investigation overlooked this figure. Also, it should be noted that the Captain Perry, that Captain Perry was wearing a long coat that evening he was murdered. It was common at the time for older men like Perry to wear a long, more formal overcoat. The young men, on the other hand, wore a shorter waist-length style. Another oddity arose over the time it took Captain Perry to walk from his home to Tom Nickerson's. The Nickerson's home is a two to three minute walk from the Captain Perry's home. Yet it took him 45 minutes from the time his daughter last saw him walking up Argyle Street to the time he arrived at Nickerson's. One popular explanation at the time of this variation was that he went to his office for a smoke. At 8.30 that evening, Captain, that evening, Captain arrived at Tom Nickerson's. Beside Tom Nickerson, also present were Mrs. McGillridge Earl, as well as Mrs. Nickerson. According to their testimony, it was a cordial visit and everyone had a good time over time over the one and a half hour they spent t together. Captain Perry left the Nickerson home at the strike of 10 p.m. Tom Nickerson testified at the murder trial that Perry told him he was first going to his office for smoke. Nickerson testified that he saw the top of Captain Perry's head passing through a huge snowbank that had accumulated on Argyle Street. From this point in time until the Captain Peer Perry nearly unconscious body was found at 11.20 p.m. by Mansfield Ross, the exact whereabouts of the Captain are uncertain. That's the snowbank. Okay. The next scene is a dramatization of what may have happened shortly after Perry arrived home. He may have been on his way into the house 
from his office or may have been going directly into the house after leaving Tom Nickerson's. It was quite quiet now. All that could be heard was a distant dark was a distant dog barking and the church and the crunch of two feet pressing against the recently fallen snow. Laying in a pool of blood was the captain. His lifeless body was slowly oozing from him. His life his lifeblood was so his lifeblood was slowly oozing from his body. He was still. Just above the scene was the captain's wife sitting in her room quietly playing, playing solitaire. The lone, the lone light from the window cast an eerie reflection over the scene. Hastily, the culprit Fred. Was he dead? The person thought. I didn't think he, that he would have put up such a struggle. Oh well, he deserved it, the person thought. The horrible man had it coming for years. I must escape without being seen. Why hadn't his wife heard his cries and the noise? Maybe she did and didn't really care. God, the street looks good. The street looks clear. I'll head home. Damn, three people coming. I'd better quickly dash past them. Great, the street light is out, so they don't shouldn't recognize me. There's Millage, Mildred Earl. What in the hell is he doing out here? i better slump down and dodge him. Watch where you're going. Earl exclaimed, you nearly forced those ladies into the snowbank. Come back here, you. Are you ladies all right? Ah, safe. I don't think anyone will see me now. I'll go home the back way. Phew, it was close. But it's a good night's work. Another odd thing that evening was the fact that there was a great number of people on the street from 10 p.m. onwards that fateful evening. It almost seems as though almost everyone was away from the Argos Street homes that evening by 10 p.m. Most stores had closed down and the movies were over. People were coming home. Even more strange was the fact that no one saw Captain Perry on the street, even though he left the Nickerson's home at 10 p.m. Between 10 p.m. and 10.30 p.m., at least eight people walked up and down the street. It was Mildred Earl who told the court that per he saw Perry. It was Mildred Earl who told the court that he saw a dark-dressed man come out of Perry's driveway around 10.20 p.m. and head in a brisk fashion down Argyle Street towards Main Street. In fact, this person was in such a rush that he or she forced Earl and three ladies who were walking up the street at the same time to step aside. So here. This way. Another neighbor, Fred Farren, who lived on Pleasant Street, west of the Perry home, testified that he heard screaming and shouting around the same time coming from the direction of the Perry house. He told the court that they sounded like Indian war hoops, war whoops, and figured they were just kids skating on the nearby Broad Brook. He placed this and as occurring between 10.20 and 10.30 p.m. that evening. The only different difficulty with this that night skate the only difficulty with this is that night skating at that hour was relatively uncommon, even in those times, especially since there was no evidence of light or bonfires coming from the area. The sky was overcast, so there was no reflecting lights from the moon. No other witnesses testified about skating on the brook. If there were no skaters, who, where was the screaming coming from? From all reports, none of these skaters even came forth. Again, the investigation skills of the police were weak, and this aspect may have been overlooked by the police. We noticed. We all noticed. Shortly after 10.30 p.m., Mansfield Ross and Eleanor Perry returned home from the evidence presented. Beatrice McKinnon appeared to have gone home on her own earlier after parting companies with Ross and Eleanor at the movies. Both Manfield Ross and Eleanor Perry testify at the trial that they both entered through the front door at 10.30 p.m. However, a neighbor, uh, Mr. Arman, told the police that he saw Eleanor go into the front door and Mansfield go around the back. 
His evidence was never given in court. The only information on this Armand is that he lived on Regent Street. Again, there was no evidence of any police follow-up to this lead. Regent Street here. So that has to be the captain's house then, right? Yeah. He went to Thomas Nickerson and then came back and he, Thomas saw him by the stomach. Okay. After Ross and Eleanor Perry entered the home, Claire Perry met them inside in the kitchen area and made them a lunch for of cream peas and toast. Apparently unknown to the three, as they were sitting around the kitchen table, Captain Perry was lying just outside, dying. According to Claire Perry's evidence, and that and that entered by Ross, Ross and Eleanor, it was around 11.20 when Perry, when Claire's, Perry's dog scratched at the front door to be let in. The dog had been away all day. It was a good watchdog, but the court was told that Ross had taken it away from the home in the afternoon. Evidence showed that he left the dog with the some boys in the south end of the town. The reasons for this was never made clear. So it sounds like they wanted to get away the dog away from the house for one reason. Oh. Ross had taken the dog. The reason for this was never made clear. Anyways, the dog made its way home on its own, arriving at the front door of the pair's home at 11.20 p.m. According to Mansfield Ross, the dog ran in the front door, through the house, and scratched the back, po back door to be let out. Around 12.45, Ross told the court that he opened the do back door to let the dog outside. Mansfield went outside to check the barn. He told the court that he was carrying a lantern and remembered walking down the path. It was not until he was on his way back to the house he saw Perry lying in the snow across the walk. Okay. So there's the map. Perry leaves the Nickerson house, Captain Horn, Perry, Perry, Argyle Street. At the trial, Ross described Perry as lying with one mitt on and the other mitt off. His hat was not on his head and his coat was pulled up around his head. After discovering Captain Perry, Ross went into the house and told both Claire and Perry, El Claire, per Claire, Eleanor, to remain inside the home. He told them not to go outside. Next, he ran next door to Williams McNutt home and used his telephone to call Dr. Webster for help. Ross returned with the neighbor, Benjamin McNutt, and Dave McIsaac around 1140. All three examined Captain Perry and determined that he was still alive. Then... For some inexplicable reason, they left Perry lying in the snow, bleeding and semi-conscious, until Dr. Webster arrived at 12.20. They made no effort to cover or comfort him. Instead, three men went inside the Perry home where it was warm. They had some tea with Claire and Eleanor while they partly waited for the, patiently waited for the doctor. According to evidence, neither the captain's wife or his daughter came to his aid. I'm getting a conspiracy. Is anyone getting a conspiracy with this? Like if your dad is laying on the back fucking step with his head smashed, like alive, face down in the snow, wouldn't you go put a blanket on him? Wouldn't you? You're not going to sit and have a cup of tea and wait for the doctor to get here. I'm, I, I don't think this was a one-person job. <laughs> this is not... It just could be the lack of evidence, but this is doesn't come off as a one-person job. Okay. Dr. Webster lived on Parade Street and took almost an hour to get to the Perry home. His trip was aggravated by snowfall earlier that day. The police chief, Charles Babin, arrived short time later, along with police constable Leland Elliott. Only after arriving... 
the arrival of Dr. Webster was par Perry taken inside. Webster was furious that everyone, including Captain Perry's wife, left him lying outside uncovered all this time. Despite the effort of Dr. Webster, Captain Perry died in his front parlor at 1.20 a.m. From the time the captain was moved inside until his death, evidence suggests that Claire was busy scrubbing the kitchen floor several times. Ross, meanwhile, was making many trips to the basement to stoke the furnace. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Both of these actions were unusual, but for some reason did not catch the attention of the police. The average person scrubbing a kitchen floor at midnight on a Saturday night needs further explanation. As for the furnace, it was established that it was a coal-burning furnace and needed to be stoked every couple of hours or so. Since coal burned slowly, according to residents, coal-burning fireplaces were often backed banked at night and were rarely checked. Why was Ross so occupied? Was he trying to hide something? No fucking shit. At the trial of Claire Perry and Mansfield Ross, it was established by the expert testimony of the three, do of three doctors that the captain was first struck with a blow to the center of the back center of center of okay the first strike with a blow to the center of the forehead as he was walking up the back steps to in, into his porch. He fell and then was struck twice at the back of the head by a blunt hard instrument. This was supported by the fact that there was a pool of blood on the back of step and floor of the porch. This part also this part is also a mystery for a pool to accumulate, Captain Perry must have laid there for a short time. During the trial, the Crown alleges that the murderer's weapon was the iron bar which Perry used daily to fix his shoes. But the Crown failed to answer in question, who wielded the murder weapon? That is a question to which there will probably never be a definitive answer. Both Claire Perry and Mansfield Ross were found not guilty on murder charges. <laughs> The case ended in August 1921. Mansfield Ross married Eleanor Perry shortly after the trial. He lived in the Yarmouth area for a few years on Chipman Lane and then moved away. Claire Perry sold the family home to Corkum family and reportedly moved to California. In 1932, Perry's home was the topic of the local news again. This time it was, after, it was arson that struck the vacant Perry home on Argyle Street. Five suspicious fires over a six-month period resulted in the house fire, in the house finally burning to the ground. Today, only the foundation of the house remains. Oh, yeah, that was a fucking conspiracy. It was like at least three people involved with that and probably one person told to shut up or you're next. That's what I got out of this story. Oh, God, it's still going. Hang on, we're not done yet. I thought the fucking think they were done. I thought we were done. All right. So who killed Captain George Perry? In Yarmouth, Captain Perry was viewed in various of ways. Few liked him, most ignored or tolerated him, and from what we understood, a lot of people would have liked to see Captain Perry dead. Why did Claire want her husband dead? The captain was... Comparatively wealthy. Okay, I'm going to bring this up if you want to read a bit of that. They had every intention of leaving him out there all night till the dog. But if they were going to leave him outside... Why not just bring the dog back inside afterwards and just ignore the body on the back step? Uh, something's not in, I go. The captain was compre comparatively wealthy man and Claire knew that she would inherit his wealth, especially if he was left no will. Evidence at trial indicate that Captain 
had drawn up his last will and testament. It was in his bedroom in a strong box, under his bed along with his other important papers. As a result, the first suspect was Claire Perry. Witnesses claimed she had been at odds with her with him for 10 years or more. According to her neighbor, she had grown to hate the man. Rumors throughout the town suggested that he was very cruel to her. And that he used a strong language and even threatened her. But then, but then Claire was a strong woman, and some even said that it was the other way around. Evidently, their marriage broke up at one point, and they separated. However, a short time later, they got back together for convenience, as divorce was frowned upon in 1921. And Claire wanted to live the comfortable life, which was guaranteed by Captain Perry. Let me get my shoes. My feet are cold. Guarantee again. This love hate relationship must have only blossomed in their early years together, as they did have three daughters. Claire, as the captain's Claire, and the captain sailed together aboard his various ships and seemed to be very close until he retired from the sea and established himself on land, selling cream separators at various farm and various farm machinery. By 1921, they had all moved away except for the youngest, Eleanor, who was still single and living at the Perry home on Argyle Street. The birth of three daughters, some say, greatly affected the captain as he really wanted a son to carry on his family name. And it was suggested in the town that both Captain and Claire may have had affairs, but there was never any evidence brought forth to substantiate this. At the murder trial, where Claire was one of the main defendants, evidence was presented which illustrated that there were several unnecessary attempts to kill him, unsuccessful attempts to kill him. Evidence was given that Claire had hired Nathaniel Adams to weaken the basement stairs in such a way that the aged, cap the aged captain would fall to his death. Apparently, the captain would go down these stairs at regular intervals each day to stoke the furnace. The idea was that the captain would fall and either die as a result or that someone would deliver the coup de grace when he arrived at the bottom. It was shown that Claire had even provided Adams with a mold of the house key so that he could enter and do the nasty job at will. Other evidence suggested that Claire had poisoned the captain's food. According to the testimony of his cousins, he was given poisonous po poison pudding, which nearly cost him his life. However, he fled to his cousin's home in Kempville, where they cleared up the illness. Again, we must remember that refrigeration was, none, was unknown in these days, and food poisoning was common, especially with milk-related products. Probably just get lactose intolerant, had the shits. It was further suggested that Claire had even meddled with his carriage so that the wheel fell off. It was said that she tightened the nuts on the carriage axis. By tightening, since it was reverse thread, you were actually loosening the wheel. The result was that he was thrown from the carriage and seriously injured. The captain was conf confined to his bed for three weeks under Claire's care. While in bed, he told a friend who testified at his trial that he feared for his life and he knew that someone was trying to murder him. Thro throughout the town people and na throughout throughout to the town's people and neighbors, Claire was a kind and caring wife. On the fatal evening, Claire testified that she was at home all alone. She stated that after Mansfield Rose Ross, her daughter Eleanor, and their friend Beatrice McLean had left to go to the movies around 7.38 to 8 p.m. She had a bath and then retired to her room where she played solitaire until they returned home around 10.30. Evidence from various passerby was that the house was in the dark except for one lone light in Claire's bedroom, which was located directly over the back porch. 
even though her husband was murdered only 15 to 20 feet away from away she claimed she heard nothing and she maintained throughout the trial that she spent the entire evening playing solitaire secondly there was manfield bross at the time of the murder ross was the fiance of eleanor perry the youngest daughter of the of claire and the captain ross worked at the yarmouth duck and yarn company I didn't know he had a Yarmouth Duck and Yarn Company. And had been keeping company with Eleanor for some time. He wanted to marry her, and Clara gave her approval, but not the captain. Court testimony of neighbors showed that Captain Perry disliked Ross because he was part black and below his daughter's station. It had been suggested that the captain was very bigoted. However, Ross was persistent, so much so that he moved into the Perry family home at 99 Argyle Street on the early afternoon of the very day that Captain would be murdered. Evidence suggested that Captain Perry was furious about this and had left the house in disgust at 1 p.m. His whereabouts after he left until he arrived at E.C. Durkee Jewelries around 4 p.m. is unknown. However, it can be suggested he was playing cards at Province Church. A third suspect was the captain's daughter. Eleanor Perry had a motive to kill her father as well. The only way she could marry Mansfield was with the captain's consent, which he was not willing to give. She also yearned for his high education, also learned for higher education, but the captain refused to allow her to pursue this dream, claiming that education would be wasted on a girl who could only get married and stay at home. Claire wanted only the best for her daughter and saw education as a pre precious thing. Eleanor's future was often at the root of arguments at the home. Eleanor, from all reports, was a very intelligent girl who was not content to spend her life as a keep woman. I guess the old version of a pick-me woman. Um, further, she was not getting any younger. Mansfield's Mansfield and she were in love and she saw them being kept apart by her bigoted narrow-minded father according to Arthur Thurston a local Yarmouth historian a fourth suspect was Carrie pa Captain Perry's 72 year old neighbor Joshua to fry Thurston in a series of publish in a series published in the late 70s in the Yarmouth Vanguard, suggested that the two men had fought over the property line for years. This was a common problem in those days, when property lines were not surveyed as carefully as they are today. But this was just the surface excuse. There since suggested the real reason for the ongoing dispute was that Joshua DeFry had tried to make a claim for a pension at a veteran of the... pension as a veteran of the... F-E-N-I-A-N. -E Fena Wars? The Fena brother, Brotherhood was an Irish group based in the United States during the latter part of the 1800s. According to accounts at the time, Trefry had never served in the, the campaign. Captain Perry had alerted authorities by swearing an affidavit that Trefry had never taken part in the conflict. Turfry lost out on his grant as a result. Turfry was furious. A further interesting sidelight side light to Joshua's character, Joshua's character is, that, is the fact that he had always been suspected of murdering his brother, Benjamin, in the late 1800s nearby Tusket. They're related! They're related! Cool. Um, Benjamin had always that Joshua's character is the fact that he had always been suspected of murdering his brother Benjamin. Well, that didn't come up in the other story, did it? Did I just miss it? Was I not paying that much attention? Oh right. Okay, I did. Ben, the Benjamin Trefire murder was a sensational 
case during the 1800s. Barry had some role in the drama, but to this date, research has not clarified this. Like Claire, Joshua was at the home of the evening of Captain Perry's murder. I wonder if Perry had a hand in Benjamin's disappearance as well. He was an old ship captain, so it wouldn't be anything to have somebody disappear into the water. Anyway. The fifth suspect is yet another neighbor, Thomas Nickerson. Rumored about abound in the town that Captain Perry had been having an affair with Nickerson's wife. This may have some credibility in that Perry's relationship with Claire was far from good. Yet, considering Perry's age and the time frame, it would have been unlikely. Okay. In spite of this, the alleged affair was the subject of gossip in the town, and it was well known that Thomas was upset about this. Gossiping is the same today as it was in the 1920s. It may have argued that it was even more vicious back then, given the fact that it was a major social activity. Television or radio had not come into the wider spread, spread being being, and the telephone was becoming very popular entirely. Like Joshua to Fry, Thomas was at the home on that fateful night. The only difficulty was that Captain Perry was invited, inviting, Captain Perry was inviting the Nickersons, inviting the Nickersons throughout the evening. But then what happened in their home? Was it a conspiracy? A sixth subject suspect was Captain Aiden Glee, who lived right across the street from Perry's home. Throughout the years, he was a good friend of Captain Perry. The two men, and occasionally Harry Milliner, would play cards and drink whiskey in Perry's office, which was an old stall in the barn. It was claimed that it was claimed that Glee often lost large amounts of money to Perry. Further, it was rumored that Glee and Perry may have planned played cards that fateful February afternoon. It is known that Perry acquired a considerable amount sum of money the day of his death. Like Claire, Trefry and Thompson Nickerson, Captain Glee was at home all night. All that night. A th seventh possibility. Jesus! It was... You hear that story where, like, the town didn't like this guy, there was, like, 60 witnesses, but no one saw him get shot? That's what this is turning into. A seventh possibility was Thomas Meade's Bram. It was believed that he once served with Perry as either a crew member or officer on board one of his ships. One unsustained account stated that Perry and another sea captain were involved in the trial of Bram over the Herbert Fuller murders. Oh, we read that in the second book. Bram was sentenced to life in prison for the brutal death of Captain Nash, his wife, and first mate, Bloomberg, of the sailing ship, the Herbert Fuller. Bram had apparently attacked his victims with an axe and was in the process of disposing of the bodies overboard when he sub was subdued by the ship's crew. Bram was released from prison in 1916 and was given a full pardon in 1919, just two years before Captain Perry died. Oh, that's all related. Oh, tangled webs we weave. And what about Harry Miller? Harry Miller. M-I-L. Milliner. Milliner was the eighth suspect. Jesus Christ. Milliner was at the back, was the black handyman who did most of the domestic work around the Perry home. According to a report, Harry and the captain were on good terms. On the surface, it appeared that he had no reason to kill the captain, unless, of course, someone hired his services for the job that evening. It is interesting that at the trial, it was revealed that Harry shoveled the, black, the back walk of the Perry property several times on the day of the murder and even shoveled the walk later that night and early the next morning. Given the testimony offered at the trial, it appeared that on February 26th, the Perry home had the cleanest walk in all of Yarmouth. And even more interesting, why just the day after the funeral, did the authorities arrest Claire and Harry at the Eastern Steamship Terminal en route to Boston together? Rumored, rumors in the town suggest they were running away together, or... 
Then there's the famous rumored poker game. The story at the time suggested a number of men, including Captain Perry, played cards at Provincial Methodist Church that fateful afternoon. Perry was the big winner, as evidence from Charles Durkee at the trial sub substantiating this. On suspects, other suspects could have been the losers in the game. It was suggested that the church was burned that night as a cover-up for the for the theft of the money from the safe. I mean, that, that's a good story. Finally, there were dozens of ruffians and thieves about. Who knew that Captain usually carried a purse containing between $500 and $600? In 1921, that was a great deal of money. In fact, it made Captain Perry a very lucrative target. It is nearly impossible, this near impossible mystery to solve all the suspects are dead, so are most of the witnesses, but research of the case has turned up several interesting points. Did Perry have his money on when he was found with his head beat in the back step? We'll find out. First, why did, Pe why did Claire Perry hear nothing that evening? At the trial, detective illustrated that she should have heard the, the skirmish outside her bedroom window. The autopsy showed that Perry tried to defend himself against the blows, as the back of his hands were badly bruised. Did he cry out for help? If he did, why did no one hear him? Or did Fred Farn mistake Captain, mistake Captain Perry's cries for help for the war whoops of the so-called skaters on Broad Brook? That would make sense. Second, why did Claire and Mansfield leave him bleeding and semi-conscious in the snow for more than an hour after the discovery had been attacked. It seems unbelievable that the wife and daughter would leave their husband and father dying uncovered and unattended outside on a winter's night while they sipped tea with neighbors. It could be suggested that they wanted him to die. Third, at 7.50 that evening, Benjamin McNutt, Peary's next-door neighbor, went out to feed his pigs at the barn. As he returned to his house, he saw the stranger standing by Peary's driveway. When McNutt approached the man, he fled. Who was this stranger? Is it possible that he had intended to attack Perry as the captain left his house for the evening by merely 20 minutes? Four. <clears throat> Police Chief Charles Babin lost his job over his blundering of the murder investigation. No shit! <laughs> Shortly after, Claire Perry hired Babin to clean out her cesspool. Rumors abounded in 1921 that the murder weapon and the captain's last will and testimony were flushed down the Perry toilet. The latter was never found, even though it was well known that the captain had drawn up a will. As a result, Claire Perry inherited the entire estate. Again, the rumor mill suggested that captain had written his will in left Claire less than she believed she was entitled to. Fifth, was it merely a coincidence that the very church where the alleged poker game took place burned down to the ground that same night? The fire distracted the police and others from the Perry case and may have destroyed evidence at the church. This disaster divided the efforts of a very small, ill-equipped, poorly trained police force. Most residents believe that the fire was diversion and was linked to the Perry murder. Six, where was Harry Milliner from 10.30 p.m. until the following morning? Harry told the court that he was at home in bed. He claimed that he had arrived home with his grandmother, Franny, at about 10 p.m. and they both went to bed. Franny used to clean the Perry home, the Perry home and do their laundry. Why was it then that Franny testified that when she asked Claire Perry who would do such a thing, the response was, you should know as well as anyone. Seventh, why did Claire and Eleanor Perry scrub the kitchen floor between 11.30 and 12.30 at night? It seems strange time to scrub a kitchen floor, indeed. Especially if you know that your husband or father is lying unconscious outside. Eight. Why was it when the police searched the premise between 1 and 2 a.m., they found nothing, but at 6.20 a.m., they found an iron bar in the back porch in a wash tub? 
The bar appeared to be freshly burnt. Police argued that the tub had been searched at least once before the bar appeared. Who put it there? Why did Manfield Ross spend so much time tending to the furnace in the basement of the Perry home from 1 to 6 a.m.? Especially when people tended to let the furnace fires die down throughout the evening. 9. What was the fresh footprint behind the barn heading in the westerly direction? Constable let Leland Elliott know there was a set of footprints that headed away from the barn for about 15 feet and just stopped in the snow. Where did they go? Whose were they? Finally, what happened to the wallet? It had never been located. When Chief Babin arrived and searched Captain Perry and searched Captain Perry at 1 a.m., Babin noted that both of the wallets and the captain's gold watch were missing. Babin testified that Mansfield Ross told him, if you find the watch, you will probably find the murderer. After all, the watch had a serial number on it. When Babin searched the body again at 1.30 a.m., the watch was there. Where did it come from? These are but a few many pieces to the puzzle that the cap puzzle that is Captain George Perry's murder. Whoever took part and whatever happened on February 26, 1921 will remain a mystery in this community for the years to come. Well, that was that was definitely that was a good one. But definitely I'm going to say the wife, the daughter, and the boyfriend. But like who had access to put the the watch back on the body? It would be those three. They could have taken it to make it look like a robbery and then put it back after thinking it would I don't know what they were thinking. I feel bad for the dog. Nope, that was a good one. All right. Well, that's two stories out of here. And, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. After the events, Joshua Trevide dies within a year after Perry murderer. Okay. After events. Okay. Okay. Thomas Nickerson South, Haley Road, Snowbank. Joshua Trefry dies with, within a year after Perry's murder. Trefry dies in 1922. William McNutt Jr. arrested for attempting to kill police chief Br Brandon Bain with a pitchfork in 1937. Perry Mansion swept by five mysterious fires, 1932-33. Claire advertises house, barn, and equipment for sale in August 1922. No offers made. Captain Glee commits suicide in Shelburne, 1926. Harry Milliner dies in 1977. Perry's last will and testament is never found, although it was claimed he made one out. He made one out. Under the law, Claire inherits everything. Chief Babin works for one week to clear out Perry's cesspool. Yes. Ex-Chief Babin. <laughs> Going from your chief of police to cleaning out a cesspool. Okay. Claire Perry leaves Yarmouth and moves to California, never heard from again. I wonder if there's any evidence of her, like, existing. Like, moving there, having kids and a family. Eleanor Perry and Mansfield Ross marry. They live in Perry Mansion until 1926. They move to the house, move to, they move to house on Clip, Chipman Lane until 1927, move West, presumably, to British Columbia. Province Church, never rebuilt, becomes a playground, still is. Oh, that's the church. That's the playground. I've been to that playground. Okay. We might do these Remember When on another episode. They're just a lot longer here. All right. We're going to do this one next time. Because I'm tired of talking, but yo, oh God, you can't even read. Where'd the sun come from? All right, sorry about that. Yeah, can you see? All right. 
I'm going to call it a night, or not call it an afternoon, I guess, and i got to go make some crafty artwork shit, so I'll probably be back with that not too long. Ah, thank you for stopping by. My apologies for my reading level, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye!